and today I want to talk about a Silverbergian subject which is very close to my heart and mind and that is the quantum indeterminacy of the Book of Skulls. As you can see behind me here on the podium, that's a UK first edition of the Book of Skulls from, um, it's actually the late 70s. The book was sort of early 70s. And there it is, Golanx first edition. And it was in the Golanx Fantasy and Macabre um, imprint rather than the SF imprint. And this is what this video is about really. Absolutely beautiful, isn't it? And it's, I really struggle to say which is my favourite Silverberg. It's certainly one of them. And the more I think about it, it probably is my favourite one. The others, my sort of other big ones would be A Time of Changes, which is fantastic. Um, Dying Inside, Downward to the Earth, The Man in the Maze. These are all really important books to me and there are others as well. Those are sort of like my sort of key ones, I guess. But when I'm trying to pick up my favourite one, I increasingly go towards this. and. Silverberg, as I say, you know, he's a multi-talented guy and I've done lots of other videos about him. And I realised the other day, and it's something I'd forgotten, he is only, he's one of only two authors who made it into all three of my books in the Bloomsbury Good Reading Guide series. His novel, um, The Man in the Maze, um, which is the, was the, only the second Silverberg I ever read. That's in my book 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels. Um, my book 100 Must Read Fantasy Novels contains Lord Valentine's Castle. This is out of print, I'm afraid. There are sort of e-books out there. Um, I should have said when I was doing a channel update that something I, I... There is a Bulgarian edition, if you're Bulgarian, of 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels in Bulgarian. And there are reportedly editions in... India and Pakistan in English, but I've never seen any money from them. And Bloomsbury told me they were coming, but maybe they never happened. But you know, you can get them on ebook all around the world, and you can get um, the books for men and 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels print on demand. They're mostly on Amazon. You get them from the ANC Black and Bloomsbury website. Anyway, enough self promotion. But, but the point was is that I was saying Silverberg made it into all three of my books in this series. and. What I chose for Books of Men was this one, The Book of Skulls. And I tried to avoid genre fiction in this, as I'd written about it a lot in the SF and fantasy books. So there's all sorts of other things in that book, fiction and non-fiction. And I choose it as a book for men, not that women can't read or women couldn't enjoy it, it's really good, because the, the main characters, there are four of them, are all men. So that was the thing. And it seemed to represent four sort of archetypes of young men. So I felt it was a particular interest to men who were who were interested in sort of young Ian archetypes and the whole sort of Iron John type thing. You know, men's studies, whatever happened to that, he said laughingly. So the only other author who made it to all three was M. John Harrison, funnily enough. And I covered the Centauri device in the SF book, um, Pastel City in the fantasy novel, first Verconian book, and in here I put Climbers, his only pure mainstream novel. So it was down to M. John and Silverberg. This is what I wrote about the Book of Skulls um, in 100 Mystery Books of Men back in 2008 when it was published. And the book was co-written with my good friend Duncan Bowis, who is a writer and teacher and former bookseller. What would you do to secure immortality? In the archives of an Ivy League campus library, intense, insecure Jewish undergraduate Eli Steinfield stumbles across an ancient, previously undeciphered document. Eli's academic genius is such that he quickly translates the manuscript, which nobody has managed before. It is entitled The Book of Skulls, a cryptic work which tells of a house where a man might find eternal life. To do so, four initiates must submit themselves to the mysteries of the skull house, but for a pair of their number to live forever, for two of them to live forever, the other two must die. Eli believes that the location of the Skull House must be in the remoteness of the Arizona desert, and he convinces his roomies at college to join his quest. Ned is a would-be writer and homosexual who lusts after Oliver, a strong, silent, 
Kansas farm boy. Then there is Timothy, a wealthy cynic who harbours the prejudices that accompany his social status and he decides to go along just for the ride. So this is a road novel and it would make an amazing film and it would be easy to make with the right budget, the right director and the right screenwriter. I do wish David Cronenberg would do it. As the Motley Quartet speed across America by car, the narrative weaves sinuously between their four viewpoints, winding tight with tension as the rivalries between the students blossom and wane. They are caught between faith and doubt, nagged by fears and hopes, and the four prepare themselves for the eruption of personal conflicts that might reward the victors with the ultimate trophy, immortality. The book has a needle-sharp tone and it transcends the fantastic premise, and it's one of Silverberg's key books. Silverberg, of course, is rightly famous for his stunning SF, and he sold his first novel at the age of 17. By the mid-60s, he was a millionaire. He produced numerous critically acclaimed non-fiction titles, including some on archaeology, which were undoubtedly, undoubtedly quite sort of useful, the research parts of that, when he wrote Book of Skulls. So There's an archaeological feel to it. And, you know, at the end of the 60s, he returned to SF and, you know, produced a string of breathtaking masterpieces over the next 10 years. Although it's always been packaged as SF, except in that Golang's hardcover, the Book of Skulls refuses easy categorization, as you'll discover when you finish the book. So don't be put off by the label if you're not an SF reader. Silverberg's urbane intelligence and fearlessness in dealing with subjects like power, sacrifice and transcendence, mashed by his astringent, stainless steel prose, is just a joy to read. This is an unputdownable introduction to an awesome writer who would have been internationally famous had he elected to work in the literary mainstream. And as you see, this is the original SF Masterworks edition from about 20 odd years ago with a Jim Burns jacket, um, which is just stunning. And the sad thing is, is that um, I think the Centipede Press edition, which came out a few years ago, might have this cover. But other than that, it's never had this wonderful artwork. And Jim lives in Trowbridge, um, quite near to me in Bath. We have met a couple of times a long time ago and have engaged online, but um, I'm hoping at some point to have a proper chat with him again. Silverberg himself has written about the denouement of the Book of Skulls, and I think it's in one of his collections of short stories. I do have it somewhere, and he, he wrote a little sort of short piece about that, and about how that it's probably not really science fiction, and as I say, it's always been marketed as such, except in this edition, it's fantasy and macabre. But it's not really fantasy either, or is it? And that's why I put it in Books for Men, because it's kind of an indeterminate work. When you get to the end of the story, and it's very compelling and compulsive and beautifully written, the characterization's amazing. Um, I think some female writers don't like it because of the way women are depicted in it, but it's more about the fact that what Silverberg does really well is he displays what young men's feelings are towards women when they're boiling with testosterone and they're young and what have you and they haven't finished sort of evolving as human beings because you know you don't really sort of calm down to about 28 my personal feeling is, is you don't become an adult till you're 28 27 28 it takes a while and the brain's still developing and you know the, the sort of evolutionary and biological imperative is there so it's a lot about sex in it it's fascinating because when you get to the end what he does he does this thing where there's no novum, as you get in a science fiction novel, where there's a new piece of technology. It's not confirmed that the immortality will be because of something scientific. Neither is there any showing of any magic or supernatural fantasy elements. So it is an indeterminate thing. And you have to read the book for yourself to find out. So it's very, very hard to say, and I believe it's impossible to tell because of what he withholds rather than what he reveals, rather than what he explains, um, whether this is a science fiction novel, a fantasy novel, or a mainstream novel. And that is genius. And in that way, it's almost unique in the annals of American New Wave SF, in that it's like a liminal gateway space a sort of black hole, a singularity between the mainstream and SF and fantasy. So it's indeterminate. It's in the slipstream, as we used to say in the 80s. Slipstream we used to use to mean it's, it feels like SF, but it probably isn't. And if you go in Forbidden Planet 
late 80s. They'd have a slipstream section. And there'd be lots of cult books in there, things by people like Charles Bukowski, who by no means was ever a genre writer, though he did a genre sort of parody called Pulp, which isn't a very good book. Um, and people like Burroughs and what have you. And really, you know, it's, it is slipstream. It's sort of in between. And that's what's fascinating about it. And as I say, Silverberg wrote about this himself. So it's like the quantum cats thing. You know, you have you have the classic quantum experiment where there's a cat in the box and in the box there's a vial of poison and there's a radioactive de decay going on and you can't see in the box is sealed and you don't know until the box is opened or not whether the poison has got out and has killed the cat, whether the cat is alive or dead. And what quantum theory says is that when you observe something at the very small scale of particle interaction, the observation itself affects the outcome. And this has been proven experimentally. I'm not going to go into the physics, you can read up on it. It's fascinating, but it seems to make no sense. And that's what's interesting about it. And I think it was Niels Bohr who said about quantum theory, I don't like it and I wish I never had anything to do with it. But they had to accept it. And Einstein didn't like it either, but he was wrong. Because if quantum didn't work, we wouldn't have a lot of the tech we have today, which is really kind of interesting. So the cat is in the box and it's alive or dead. When we open the box, it's the act of opening the box that collapses the wave function, is what it's called. And then we see whether the cat's alive or dead. Until then, in the box, it's in an indeterminate state. It's both, both alive and dead. It's when we observe. Now, even when we observe the Book of Skulls, the information about what its genre status is, is withheld. So it's in an indeterminate state. So until Robert tells us what it is and does a revised edition, which I hope he never, ever, ever does, then this is really groundbreaking. Now, in British SF from the New Wave, there are a number of examples. They're mostly later on than this, to be fair, of books which might be SF and they might not be, particularly the work of Christopher Priest, especially novels like The Affirmation and The Glamour, which is my favourite novel by Priest. And we're going to talk about that in some depth at one point, because there's four different editions of The Glamour, four different variant texts. And this was a very brave step. And it's a shame, really, it's never been published as a mainstream novel. Now, you might say, well, there are lots of books which are published as mainstream novels, which feel like SF or fantasy, or there are fantastic novels which are set in other realms, but there's no supernatural. So it's nothing special. But there is a difference because, of course, we're talking about a very definite intent. Silverberg, a practiced SF writer of great skill, extreme experience and for a long time you know award winner and involved in new wave a guy who liked all sorts of writing and could do all sorts of writing you know he made that decision to convey this indeterminacy and doing that from the position of a genre science fiction writer a writer who grew up in the magazine tradition the pop tradition the paperback original tradition then that was quite a bold thing to do. When mainstream writers do it, um, and their book is packaged as a mainstream novel, and they hold things back, that's because, and you know, and, and I can't always say this is the case, but mostly it's because they and their publisher don't want them to be tainted with sci-fi. What they want, they, and even they don't like to be tainted with SF either, or science fiction, or maybe even structural fabulation. The point is this, is that, you know, that can actually pull an author back and hold them back commercially with a mainstream audience. The, the more snobby sort of side of it doesn't doesn't really sort of like SF. You know, they make assumptions about SF based on what they've seen on screens rather than what's read in books. It's judged by the lowest common denominator rather than the highest. So it's rather like saying, oh, you know, uh, mainstream fiction's no good because, and you can name sort of like any low grade romance or you can say well you know it's John Grisham you know is a terrible stylist you know when maybe you should say you know well, but what about you know James Joyce the mainstream would invoke the high modernists rather than the sort of popular writers and you know no in sort of John Grisham here you know I've never read it myself quite frankly um, but you know it's the populist versus the literary and the refined you know and so you know, you'll get SF judged by something really sort of poor you know something badly written so there you go so the quantum indeterminacy of the book of skulls that's why i love it um it's just the one reason why i love it i love it generally i think it's superb writing i think it's got 
all those themes which I've said about many many times as the guys in this they wish to sort of transcend and transform but they have to do something bad two of them have to die for two of them to live forever and do they live forever well that's an answer you can find out only by reading the book and my whole thing with this is that there's sacrifice um, it, but is there redemption a classic Silverberg theme is there redemption I will say that if there was a focus character of the four one naturally makes the assumption and this is the wrong sort of assumption to make but I'm going to make it anyway because Eli Steiner is Jewish he's sort of intellectual classic learned Jew and Silverberg is a classic learned Jew and and you know we, we really need these guys you know Malzberg, Cronenberg, Silverberg a great tradition of well-read learned Jewish writers and artists fantastic guys all three of my absolute favorites I really revere them and of course Eli is the one who translates the book of skulls and he's the one that sets them off on this road so that's quite interesting so is Eli a expression of Silverberg? Possibly, possibly not. Don't assume he's the mouthpiece. This idea where people assume that a certain character is a mouthpiece of the author is just is just not, you know, it's, it's fiction, it's a game, it's made up, it's a story. It might draw on life, but it doesn't necessarily represent the author's own views. I think it was Oscar Wilde that said that a real artist puts nothing of themselves in their work. Um, and just shows beautiful things and um, I don't know if that's entirely true of Wilde's own work but it sounds good it's certainly quoted in Velvet Goldmine maybe that's made up who knows I'll have to check it out so I do like Wilde but I haven't read him for years so that's the Book of Skulls if you haven't read it do it's an amazing novel it hopefully will be a gateway for those of you who read SF into the slipstream and into reading mainstream and associational fiction by SF writers. I hope it'll get you to read the English New Wavers who moved into the mainstream like Priest and Ballard and what have you because that is one of those great things. One of my favorite things in publishing in the 1970s and 80s is associational mainstream novels by SF writers which aren't SF or fantasy or maybe they are. Anyway this is Outlaw Bookseller with Robert Silverberg. I wish he was here actually. I, I, I've met him once. Um, nice man and I'd love to sort of meet him again it'd probably never happen but signing out for now bye <laughs>